Um, now that we've talked about fronts and I introduced the concept of a mid-latitude cyclone, I'm going to talk a little bit about the life cycle of a cyclone. So similar to how we as humans have different stages in our life, birth, infancy, childhood, teenagehood, young adulthood, middle adulthood, seniors, and then dead. Cyclones also have different life stages. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're also going to talk about how these nasty little boogers form in the first place. And it's going to rely on some stuff that we've already talked about in the previous modules. So you may have to go back and review things a little bit, but I promise you it's not too bad. All right. So first off, what is a mid-latitude cyclone? Well, a mid-latitude cyclone is a low pressure system like this one right here a low pressure system and attached to the low pressure system is some combination of warm, cold, and occluded fronts. And mid-latitude cyclones represent some of the strongest weather systems here in the United States. And this particular mid-latitude cyclone on this image is what's called a nor'easter. And nor'easters actually create some very interesting weather along the Northeast United States. Usually very strong winds that come in off the ocean. That creates a lot of high tide that also creates a lot of wave damage and then also substantial amounts of snow. And usually the weather up here is the worst of the entire storm. We'll talk about why that is in a few modules when we talk about hurricanes. Uh, they behave very similar to this, but that'll be more for a future module. So how do these cyclones develop? Well, there's a nice little YouTube video on it right here, and I'll actually post this in the, um, in the description below. So you'll have it to watch. But how do these things form? Well, they form via a process called cyclogenesis. And cyclogenesis is the term that we use to describe the formation of cyclones. Cyclo means cyclone, and genesis means beginning. And I'm sure that you've all heard of genesis at some point in your life, either through a famous book that I won't mention right now, or through... Um, a video game console called the Sega Genesis or whatever, but Genesis just means beginning. So cyclogenesis, beginning of cyclones. Now, meteorologists usually follow what's called the Norwegian model of cyclogenesis, also called the polar front theory. So let me walk you through this theory. There are six key stages to it. I'm gonna blitz through them right now and then I'm going to talk about them more in depth in the next few slides. So there are six steps. The first step is called the polar front stage. In the polar front stage, you have a warm air mass to the south and a cold air mass to the north. And they really aren't moving relative to each other. So between them, you have a stationary front. Then something happens, some kind of disturbance causes a kink to develop. And I'm going to use this word kink a few more times in the next few slides. I'm going to talk more about how this kink forms at the end of this lecture. But we need to understand what it does first, and then we'll care about why it happens. This kink creates two different fronts. On one side of the cyclone, we have a warm front where warm air is pushing north. On the other side, we have a cold front where cold air is pushing south. Eventually, this warm air advances ahead, cold air advances behind this front, creating what's called an open wave. As this storm begins to intensify, eventually what happens is this warm front gets caught up by the cold front, and that is what causes what's called occlusion, and then eventually the two fronts zip together and you just get a boundary between cold air on one side and cold air on another side. 
That's really a very boring situation, and the cyclone begins to die there. Eventually, the low pressure that formed in the cyclone cuts off from the frontal boundary and fades away into nothingness. All right, now that I've talked about it in brevity, let me detail each one of these steps. So, the first step is the polar front stage. What happens here, and this is very common in the United States, is we have a stationary front that acts as a boundary between warm air to the south from the tropics and cold air to the north. And along this front, nothing's really happening. Everything's in harmony. And so there's no real storms. There's nothing really interesting going on. It's just simply a boundary between warm air and cold air. Then the kink happens. Once the kink happens, warm air begins to push to the north, cold air begins to push to the south, and cyclonic motion begins to develop. And remember, cyclonic motion is counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Regardless of which hemisphere, though, warm air begins to move towards the pole, cold air begins to move towards the equator. All right, so low pressure develops, cold air begins to advance south, warm air begins to advance north. And as we learned in the last lecture, as warm air advances, it pushes cold air out of the way, the warm air rides up and over the cold air, cools and condenses, and we get precipitation here. And then the same thing happens down here as the cold air pushes in, it pushes warm air up, creating precipitation over here. Now, at this point, the fronts are still very weak. They haven't really matured much, and so there's not a lot of precipitation yet. However, as the storm continues to develop, as it continues to grow, precipitation begins to really form ahead of these two fronts in these two areas here. And we end up getting this three-pronged system where we have cold air ahead of the warm front, cold air behind the cold front, and this warm sector in between the two. At this point, precipitation begins to intensify. The low pressure becomes deeper, meaning that the pressure near the center becomes lower and lower and lower, and the storm really begins to grow in strength. Then eventually, this warm front travels very, very slow. This cold front travels very, very fast. And eventually, the cold front catches up to the warm front. The moment this happens, the storm is at its most intense. This is called the mature stage. This is when occlusion begins. At this point, this warm sector right here begins to diminish as the cold front and the warm front zip up along each other. During the mature stage, the northwest end of this whole system is the most intense. So the worst weather is happening here. The worst weather is happening here. Eventually what happens is as the warm front and the cold front slam into each other as they begin to zip up, the occluded front glow begins to grow and the cyclone begins to weaken. This is what's called advanced occlusion. Along this point, or at this point, the warm front is quickly being sucked up by the cold front. It's quickly being overtaken by the cold front. This warm sector quickly diminishes, and eventually what you get is you no longer have an air mass boundary between warm and cold air anymore. Eventually what happens is the two fronts completely zip up and the air masses stop moving relative to each other. Without any additional warm air, 
We no longer have that warm rising air, therefore we don't have any more precipitation. This low breaks off from the front and it becomes what's called a cutoff low. And eventually it just falls apart. And we're back to square one again. So we start with, again, just going back to this, just a stable boundary between cold and warm air. Some kind of kink develops, creating a frontal wave. As this low pressure begins to intensify, we get what's called an open wave that develops. Eventually, the cold front catches up to the warm front and occlusion begins. At this point, the storm is at its strongest. Then advanced occlusion occurs as the warm sector begins to shrink and get smaller and smaller. This warm sector is what provides food, fuel to the storm, all that warm, moist air. Once that warm, moist air gets cut off, the front quickly dies off, becomes stationary again, and the cyclone breaks off from the front. With all that said, none of this would happen without that initial kink. So what on earth causes that kink? Well, that kink actually doesn't begin at the surface. It begins aloft. And if you remember from a previous lecture, aloft simply means higher in the atmosphere. And if you recall the two column model, when you get divergence aloft, that means air is escaping aloft, that causes pressure at the surface to lower feeling convergence at the surface. So we get divergence aloft, feeling convergence at the surface. This convergence creates low pressure. This low pressure begins to cause cyclonic motion. And as a result, it's divergence aloft that causes convergence at the surface. If we didn't have this divergence aloft, we wouldn't have convergence at the surface and we wouldn't get a mid-latitude cyclone. So it all begins with divergence aloft. As that divergence becomes more intense, that causes convergence at the surface to become more intense, creating low pressure and creating a mid-latitude cyclone. Now I'll talk more about this diverge or this convergence aloft later, but for now let's just focus on this image over here. Now, how does this actually look like in the upper atmosphere? Well, in order to determine where divergence is happening aloft, we actually look at the jet stream. In the jet stream, we have an interesting shape that begins to occur. Along the jet stream, we have winds that are flowing from west to east like so. However, these winds rarely flow straight. Rather, the jet stream is usually very wavy. And one of the waves that occurs is what's called a trough. Along a trough, these winds sink down to the south. One thing that's interesting is as they sink down to the south, on one side of the trough, they converge. I don't know why that happened, but oh well. On one side of the trough, they converge. This side, they converge. On the other side, the front of the trough, they diverge. And it's here. It's here where we get convergence at the surface. So divergence aloft occurs on the right side, the front of a trough. Convergence aloft occurs on the back or the left side of a trough. And we end up getting a system that looks something like this. Along a trough, what you get is you get this divergence on the front end of the trough which creates the low pressure at the surface in the stormy weather. On the back of the trough, 
you have convergence aloft that creates high pressure at the surface. And there's a little animation that shows this. Um, I'll post the link to this animation in, um, in the, um, the section below, in, in the, the details below uh, of this video. Um, but this is also, this comes from a textbook and I don't want to show it here and then have the lawyers from the textbook company calling me because that's a call that nobody wants to take. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is some of these cyclones actually occur on the lee side of mountains. And this happens because on one side of the mountain you get convergence aloft. On the other side of the mountain you get divergence aloft. The convergence aloft ahead on the windward side occurs because all this air near the surface of the earth is now being squeezed together near the top of the mountain. Then once you get to the other side, it begins to spread out again, just like a slinky. And as such, you get divergence aloft over here, convergence at the surface, and lee waves form. Now, here in the United States, this happens on the eastern end of the Rocky Mountains, and it actually creates some of the strongest storms that we get here in the United States. Now, lee waves aren't the only storms that we get, though. There are other places where conditions are ripe for low, for low pressure formation. One location is over the Gulf of Alaska, Another location is over the Gulf of Mexico and on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Another location is near Alberta, just east of British Columbia and Canada. And then, as I just mentioned, on the eastern end of the Rocky Mountains. And it's these Gulf of Alaska lows that give us our rain. It's these Colorado lows that actually create severe weather and tornadoes over here in Tornado Alley, which we'll talk about in the next module. And then over here, these Gulf lows and these Hatteras lows are what create nor'easters. And we'll talk more about nor'easters in, in a couple of modules. And then as far as high pressures are concerned, most high pressure systems form over interior Canada and then begin to travel down into the United States. Usually these high pressures create very cold, very stable weather when they occur. And then these lows usually create very stormy weather. Now just a quick review of this module before I bid you adieu. Um, Air masses are large bodies of air with similar temperature and humidity throughout. Fronts are simply the boundary between two different air masses. And I want you to know the conditions before, during, and after a front. And I have a, a, um, a handout that I'll post online. Occluded fronts occur because cold fronts catch up to warm fronts. And mid-latitude cyclones develop because of divergence aloft. That's it for this lecture, and that's it for this module. I'll see you next time. Until then, I'm Terrence Mullins. Have a good one.